Our speaker is Mark Lilla, Professor of Humanities at Columbia University, as well as a prize-winning essayist for the New York Review of Books and other publications worldwide. Today he will be discussing The Once and Future Liberal, After Identity Politics. This book is based on an op-ed article that appeared in the New York Times shortly after the 2016 election. This piece argued that, quote, the fixation on diversity in our schools and in the press has produced a generation of liberals and progressive narcissistically unaware of conditions outside their self-defined group." End quote. As to be expected, Professor Lilla was applauded by some readers for being so vocal while denounced by others. This essay ignited a firestorm of controversy. With more than 1.5 million views, the piece was the number one ranked political opinion essay of 2016 that appeared in the New York Times. There is, I think, a, a crisis of democratic citizenship in all advanced democracies right now. And uh, you see a degradation of the sense of what it is to be a citizen and uh, not only what one's rights are, but especially what, what one's duties are. And so looking at the American case, I think, provides a window into this larger uh, phenomenon. So let me go over the partisan argument which I first laid out uh, in, in rough form in an article uh, which Joanne just mentioned, which I wrote in two afternoons and created this enormous stir. Well, I wrote in response to uh, the Trump election, uh, but I wanted to argue that uh, its significance was not uh, uh, just limited to the election itself and that the, ca the, uh, the causes of not only the loss but the phenomenon of Trump himself needed to be searched much further back, that the election was more than about Hillary Clinton, it was about more than uh, Mr. Comey, it was about more than Russians that the defeat of the Democratic Party and the retreat of liberalism in this country has been going on for 30 years, 30 to 40 years. And just to throw some numbers at you, uh, during the Obama years, the Democratic Party lost between 900 and 1,000 seats in state legislatures in this country. At this moment, Republicans control two-thirds of all state legislatures, they control two-thirds of all governorships, and they control 24 states outright. Democrats control seven. And if Republicans win one or two more state legislatures, they could, if they wanted to, call a constitutional convention. That's important. And that message needs to be heard, that there are parts of the country where it's simply a no-go zone for Democrats and for liberalism. And no demographic changes are going to change that picture. It's a fantasy to think that because we may soon become a minority, a majority-minority country, that somehow that means that this is going to be a liberal or democratic country. Uh, the data shows that as people become better off, they tend to become more conservative as they get older as well, and especially on economic matters as they do uh, better, um, as they do better economically. And as you probably know, uh, Donald Trump won about 30% of the Latino vote, and Romney had won more. So there's no demographic fix for this. Democrats, liberals need to understand how we lost our grip on the American imagination. Why is it that we're unable to project an image of the kind of country that we want to build together, a vision that would draw people together, 
where they would see themselves in the message and fill them with hope about building something together. Well, there's several reasons, I think, why, uh, just proximate reasons, why the Democratic Party at this moment is unable to offer such a vision. The first is that ever since um, 1972, in the nomination of George McGovern, we, we've been in a different universe in the Democratic Party, that the Democratic Party used to have its roots in uh, the white working class the black and black voters. And uh, the party itself was uh, the, sort of the muscle of the party uh, were, were union officials and state and local officials who had automatic seats to democratic conventions. With the reforms of 1972, that was changed. Two things became more important than building up that base and that connective tissue. One was movement politics, and the other was presidential campaigns. And so the Democratic Party now is driven mainly by people in the campaigns and people who are uh, committed uh, especially to particular movements. Now, social movements have done a lot in this country. There was a period in our history from the mid-50s, I would say, up until about 1980, where the real action in American politics was in social movements. Not only social movements for things like the environment and human rights, but also social movements for various identity groups. Uh, but ever since 1980, the ground has shifted, and, I'll, uh, and, and the rules of the game, I think, have shifted, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but during that period, movements tied to group identity became increasingly important. In the past 20 years, there's been a shift from group identity as a uh, focus for building a democratic coalition in the way that Jesse Jackson talked about a rainbow coalition, the idea was that you would have various people, in, you would have people in different groups, but they would come together for some sort of common purpose with an understanding that the idea was to incorporate citizens of every group into the great democratic we. But over the past 20 years or so, the shift has even been intellectually, you see in the universities, but even out there in the social movements, a shift from group thinking about the group to thinking about personal identity. Identity understood now not as some result of a history that is, for example, there is no such thing as race. Rather, there's a history that has produced a distinction of races and then around that things have grown. But something happened in our society more generally where we became fascinated and fixated on our personal identities. An identity now understood as a little homunculus, a little person that lives inside of us, the ghost in the machine. So people will talk about their identities as if it's this little thing locked within. My identity is not doing too well today. It's got a cold. <laughs> or I'm discovering other parts of my identity. And that was a shift. And what's important about that, I mean, many things are important, but is that there was a shift uh, from groups that are involved in politics to the care of the self and one's own identity, and one's feeling about who one is, that shows up not only in our politics, but in our culture everywhere. And I don't have to elaborate on that. You know that so well. The third thing that happened is that as there was a shift from group to personal identity, there also was a shift from focus on politics and winning elections to evangelism. That the rhetoric of identity in this country has become that of the great evangelical movements of the past few centuries. The fact that the word woke is being employed all the time is a dead giveaway. That comes from the Great Awakenings. How do you get woke? You get woke by recognizing your sins 
falling on your knees, confessing your sins, being taken to the River Jordan and being dipped into it, and finding a new life. And so that is very, you know, a very American way of conceiving one's spiritual life, one's psychological life, this idea that you need a conversion. And the kind of moral fanaticism that comes naturally to us. You know, for, I, one day a historian is going to have to uh, uh, sort of uncover how it happened that Europeans, for example, ever since the 18th century, have thought of Americans as pragmatic people, you know, the people who just care about what works, when in fact we are the most fanatical, least practical people on earth. We love nothing better than to join a moral cause, to denounce people, put scarlet letters on them, and pat ourselves on the back for our moral purity. We think of politics in moral terms, or moral, but we become moralistic. And there's a difference between being moralistic and moral, just as there's a difference between having an obsession with washing your hands all the time and actually being clean. And so, th so this evangelical fanaticism about identity that's been with us over the past decade, and for some reason since 2014 has just taken over our, our media and taken over much of our politics. And among the problems with that is that when you're on an evangelical crusade with a social movement, the first thing that matters is purity, not victory that keeping your apron clean, getting your position right, making sure everyone's speaking the same way, and not using any words that ought not be used becomes more important than actually seizing power. And the result has been that liberals, the Democratic Party, have become incapable of protecting the very people they say they want to help in these groups. At the moment, women have a constitutional right to have an abortion. Yet there are large parts of the country where the right to abortion is being curtailed, and there are places where you simply cannot get them, and doctors take their lives into their own hands if they try to provide them. Um, in state after state, voting rights for African Americans are being chipped away, subtly and not so subtly, by gerrymandering and even uh, jiggling around the hours that polls are allowed to be open. It makes it hard for people who work late, say, to go and to vote. And then it, it, there are cities that have passed legislation uh, for gay rights and for dealing with transgender people and transgender children. But in red states where the um, state government is Republican, those laws have been overturned. So politics and the need to exercise power needs to be paramount in the minds of American liberals, and at the moment it is not. It has become more important to speak truth to power than to seize power to defend the truth. And it's that situation that frustrated me and got me to write uh, the article and then the book. And at the end of the book, I talk about um, some things we might do or begin to do, what it would mean, sort of lay out what it would mean to reorient ourselves. And so I suggest that we need to turn back and get back in touch with our basic principles as liberal Democrats, which I think are solidarity and equal protection under the law, appeal to citizens as citizens, and to help people in different groups see that the principles that we stand for address their problems. The problem of, for example, small towns, formerly manufacturing towns that no longer have jobs. Families have the problems we know, the cities are shuttered, windows are broken, and on the, uh, out of democratic solidarity, we need to help our fellow citizens there. Citizens helping citizens. Similarly, if a black motorist is being stopped all the time by the cops and sees those lights flashing in the rear view mirror, we need to protect that person. And we do it on the same principle, on the basis of solidarity. So if we can convince people of the principles, 
then people who have different identities, have different problems, can see themselves reflected in that and in the party, and hopefully we can build a, a, build a party and a base that is, is more cemented by this attachment to principle than to particular identities. And the party needs to reach out to every state. You cannot have a two-coast strategy and expect to protect the people that you say you want to protect. Okay, well that's sort of a precy of the um, polemical article uh, uh, argument. But it, lay, it rests on a, his, on a historical argument, and I'll just lay that out um, very briefly. I argue in the book that you can divide up the past century uh, of American political history back to the 30s into two dispensations. I call them dispensations, that's a theological term. I call one the, the Roosevelt Dispensation and the other the Reagan Dispensation. And the Roosevelt Dispensation lasted from the New Deal, the 1930s, down until 1980. And uh, in this dispensation, um, for the first time in our, in our history, I think, uh, there developed a modern ideology that was democratic ideology that was based on the notion that government can and should be active at the national level and at the local levels for the public good, that we were not a minimal state, and that the failure of Republicans to face the two major challenges of the time, fighting fascism abroad and fighting uh, the depression at home, opened up a new era when there was a new language for politics and a vision of what the American promise was. And the watchwords of this era were solidarity, opportunity, and public duty. And the thinking was that there are people in this country who were not fully enfranchised as citizens because of their poverty, because of other um, disadvantages, and that people needed to be incorporated as citizens. And what's interesting about political dispensations is when they happen, they set the terms of political debate so that even the opposite party has to work within it. And so you recall that it was Richard Nixon who was the first to propose a guaranteed minimal income in this country and national health insurance. Why? Because the expectations of the public were such that these are things we care about. And Nixon wanted to steal the Democratic thunder, provide a Republican version of it. After the failures of the uh, Roosevelt Dispensation and all the things we know about, Vietnam, Watergate, and so on, Reagan is elected, and to my mind, a new dispensation began, and a different picture of what the country was. Not a nation of citizens engaged in a common project uh, to help each other through government, but rather a picture of the country as essentially an agglomeration of individuals. Individuals who live in their families, engage in business, uh, are members of churches, but there was no room in this picture for active citizenship as a way of people helping each other through government action. And so there was a, an image of a new city on the hill that Reagan spoke about, but it was not a political city. The argument was that Americans, American society flourishes best when people are left to their own devices, and when the economy is allowed to grow, and government no longer is the problem. You recall that Reagan said over and over again that government's not the solution, government is a problem. Not bad government, not tyrannical government, not particular programs, but government itself. And this radical, anti-political message became the basis of the Republican Party, and it became increasingly radical over the years uh, in, in, in ways that Reagan, I think, would not have recognized. And, uh, but you can see the essence of it. You know, every Jesus has his own St. Paul. And uh, Reagan's St. Paul, I think, someone who radicalizes the doctrine, is um, Grover Norquist, who said uh, about 10 years ago, my ideal citizen is the self-employed, homeschooling, IRA-owning guy with a concealed carry permit because that person doesn't need the goddamn government for anything. <laughs> That's some picture of what it is to be an American. 
and it couldn't be more different from the picture that was aspirationally put forward in the Roosevelt dispensation. What happened to liberalism during the Reagan dispensation? Well, you, would have, you might have thought that in the face of a challenge <clears throat> to uh, political action as such, as legitimate, that liberals might have provided a political vision of the country to contrast with the anti-political one in the Reagan years. That it, there would have been an effort to learn from past mistakes, adapt the message to what the kind of country we were, we are, and uh, reassert the importance of uh, common political action and, um, and filling people with hope and ambition to create something together. Instead, the Democratic Party and American liberals fell into the rhetoric and the divisive rhetoric of identity politics. First, as, as I said, uh, focusing on groups and later on the idea of this unique self. And so politics in the Reagan dispensation increasingly, and especially in, in recent years, has become about self-expression. Politics is self-expression rather than persuasion or building something together. And this identity ideology governs uh, much of our educational system. And if anyone becomes a liberal, uh, liberal citizen, that person becomes it increasingly in college because we are a party of educated elites along with uh, certain minorities and pu public employees. And so there was an abdication on the liberal side, an abdication of, from the um, struggle for the American imagination, the American political imagination. And as, as a society, as we've become more obsessed with our personal identities, the notion of identity has even changed. I talk about it in the book as the Facebook model of identity. It's not that history has determined that I am uh, uh, considered black or white or Asian or a woman or gay, but rather the self is this very precious thing. It's a mix of all these things. I get to decide what my identity is. So the conception of politics is that it's an extension of the self rather than an overcoming of the self in order to join in a common enterprise. And so uh, students are encouraged to be increasingly self-absorbed, petulant, and this has produced the campus follies that are all too familiar to you. And as this has happened, as people across the country who are not part of our blessed elite look at us, they see us as a detached elite, contemptuous of the rest of the country, self-absorbed, and not sharing any values with them. So where are we now? Well, where we are, I think, after these two periods, after this past 30 years, is that we, are, we have just seen the death of two ideologies that were about the unmaking of citizens. On the right, an ideology that denied the existence of a common good, that pictured the country as a campsite where you just pull in your RV and you plug into the electric and the water and get the Wi-Fi password and you, then you head off on the road, right? Uh, that's the kind of country we are. And so you have a denial of citizenship there. And then you have an ideology that tells young people that you are not equal citizens trying to do something together, but rather essentially you are individuals with unique identities. And to the extent that you get involved in politics, it has to be an expression of that. And in 2016, we saw that both of these ideologies are exhausted and have been rejected. Because I do see the election of Donald Trump as the end of the Reagan dispensation. Trump is not to the right of Reagan. He's not to the left of Reagan. 
he didn't come from right or left, he came from below. <laughs> and, uh, well, I mean, this, I mean this in many senses. <laughs> but he came from below. And also in, in the populist sense of coming up, the opportunity was there because neither party and neither ideological camp was able to offer a vision of what we can to do, what we can do together as a country. We are officially now a visionless society. So what's to be done? One is that no matter how atomized we become as a society, the fact is there is always a common good. There are problems that are common to us. The environment, international relations, obviously, health, education, the economy. So we do have common problems. What we lack is a way of articulating that and articulating a way in which we can uh, meet them together in a way that's consistent with the fact that we live in a more atomized society without denying that and having a romantic notion of going back to the New Deal. That's the challenge, and to articulate this vision. Because the problem with politics is that you go into it with the country you have, not the country you might wish for. Thank you. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.